Hi, I'm Marsha Althaus, and I will be presenting the next program in the Decade series, the 1940s. Thank you for joining me for Living in Lansdale in the 1940s. The 1940s were characterized by relative calm and prosperity, to escalation of world tension to all-out war. Winston Churchill became the Prime Minister of Great Britain in 1940 and was an integral part of World War II in Europe. Franklin Delano Roosevelt won a fourth term as president in 1944, and the bombing of Pearl Harbor launched the U.S. into war with Japan. So many men were involved in the armed forces, women took over the workforce at home, and Rosie the Riveter became their symbol. Speaking of riveters, Kilroy with here was a popular expression during the war. Shipyard builders were paid by the number of rivets they put in and would make a chalk mark at the end of the shift. The next worker could make a mark further back on the same seam, giving himself credit for part of the previous workers. But an inspector, James J. Kilroy, at the Four River Shipyard in Quincy, Mass., caught on and stopped the dishonest practice by writing, Kilroy was here, ending the double count and increased pay. After the war, Kilroy served on the Boston City Council and the Massachusetts House of Representatives. Battles were fought on the beaches of Normandy in the June 1941 D-Day invasion. The concentration camp at Auschwitz was liberated by Soviet forces and Buchenwald was liberated by the Americans. An American flag was raised at Iwo Jima in February 1945 to signal the end of one of the bloodiest battles of the war. FDR died in office just before the end of the war. And Harry S. Truman assumed the presidency. The Enola Gay piloted by Colonel Paul Tibbetts and Captain Robert Lewis dropped an atomic bomb on Hiroshima and later Nagasaki was destroyed, causing Japan to surrender in August 1945. Germany had already surrendered in May. In the early 40s, while World War II was raging in Europe and the Pacific, Life in Lansdale went on pretty much as usual, with many borough manufacturers joining the war effort with defense production. When the Andale plant on Hancock Road burned in 1941, it stopped defense production for the Navy in the area. When Pearl Harbor was attacked, Lansdale hit the ground running with increased salvage efforts primarily tin and aluminum and other materials, which were organized by the Lansdale Defense Salvage Committee. Blood drives, rationing of gas, sugar, and other foods, blackouts and air raid drills, plane spotting stations, victory gardens, and a very busy draft board were all part of life in Lansdale. The war effort was supported by the sale of war stamps and bonds, ranging from as little as a 10 cent stamp to a $750 bond. Stamp sales were very popular at school and the elementary schools were more or less in competition. Lansdale forgot the drudgery of rationing and air raid drills and had a little fun when the Lansdale Merchants Association organized the largest sale of stamps and bonds. On July 1st, 1942, 
the section of Broad Street between Main and Third was closed for a dance known as the Stamperee. Leroy Miller, the musical clocker from KYW Radio, was the MC, and the Ed Hall Orchestra and Kay Parker provided the music. Montgomery County Congressman J. William Ditter and other officials at attended. Sales of the, at the Stamperie were over $120,000, exceeding the $100,000 goal. Approximately 30% of eligible Lansdale residents served in some capacity during the war and were honored on an enormous sign sponsored by the Lions Club. The sign at West Main and Walnut contained nearly 1,000 names. Later, another sign across Main Street welcomed home Lansdale's service men and women. Oops on the misspelling. High school students joined the support of the war effort by electing a one period a week war activity class. They could choose between first aid, garment making, war handicrafts, aviation graphics, science of flight, war geography, civil defense, or math for war workers. The class of 1944 adopted a war orphan from England, a 10-year-old boy, James George Allen. The post-war years brought on a baby boom, growth of industry and housing and infrastructure as we recovered from years of war. At home, Mount Rushmore was finished, the United Nations was formed, and the first Cannes Film Festival was held in France to preview new films. Smoking was said to be a cause of cancer. The French introduced the bikini in the summer of 1946. Dave, Babe Dietrichson won the British Open and many other championships. Chuck Yeager broke the sound barrier. Hollywood actors Charlie Chaplin, Orson Welles, Lena Horne, and Artie Shaw, among others, were blacklisted for being in contempt of Congress because they were suspected of supporting the Communist Party. In 1948, the State of Israel was formed, and a year later, NATO. Paperback books were popular, and RCA introduced the first 45 RPM record. Vivian Lee, Jimmy Stewart, Gary Cooper, and Greer Garson won Academy Awards for acting. Gone with the Wind, Rebecca, Casablanca, and Going My Way won top honors at the Academy Awards during the 40s. Hattie McDaniel was the first African-American actor to win an Academy Award, but she was not allowed to attend the Atlanta premiere of Gone with the Wind. Pinocchio and Bambi and Fantasia were produced by Disney and loved by children. If we could afford a black and white TV without a remote control, we tuned into the Arthur Godfrey Talent Scouts, Candid Camera, Craft Television Theater, Meet the Press, and the ever popular Ed Sullivan Show. Kids loved The Lone Ranger, Hopalong Cassidy, my personal favorite, Kukla Fran and Ollie, and of course, Howdy Doody. The Golden Globes for Excellence in T Film and Television were first awarded in 1943 and the Emmy Awards for Television in 1949. 
Children were reading The Little Prince, Good Night Moon, Cheaper by the Dozen, another personal favorite, Stuart Little, and Make Way for Ducklings. The Grapes of Wrath won a Pulitzer Prize, A Tree Grows in Brooklyn, Death of a Salesman, For Whom the Bell Tolls, Animal Farm, and Diary of a Young Girl, The Anne Frank Story, were all popular books. On the sports scene, in 1943, the All-American Girls Pro Baseball League was created and later immortalized in the 1992 film, A League of Their Own. Stan Musial, Warren Spahn, Ted Williams, Hank Greenberg, Bob Feller, Joe DiMaggio, and other sports legends put their careers aside and served in the armed forces. In 1946, Jackie Robinson made sports history by becoming the first black major league player when he signed with the Brooklyn Dodgers. The St. Louis Cardinals and the New York Yankees dominated World Series play, winning a combined seven of the series in the decade. Sugar Ray Robinson won the welterweight title and boxing became even more popular. He was born Walker Smith Jr. and at the age of 15, he dropped out of high school to pursue a boxing career. But he was not old enough to get an AAU membership card. So what did he do? He borrowed the birth certificate of a friend, Ray Robinson. Sugar was added when a female fan said he was sweet as sugar. The 1940 Olympics had been scheduled for, of all places, Tokyo, but because of the war were moved to Helsinki, Finland, and ultimately canceled, as were the 1944 Games. The Olympics resumed in 1948 in Samaritz, Switzerland, where Dick Button of the United States won gold for figure skating and was the first to complete a double axle in competition. The U.S. dominated the Summer Games in London, winning 84 medals, one of which was a gold for Bob Mathias in the decathlon. Matthias would later join the United States Marine Corps and become a congressman from California. Lansdale sports were dominated by semi-pro baseball, the Big Six Amateur Football Conference Lansdale Falcons, an adult football league, and of course, Lansdale high school teams. As veterans returned from the war, some considered themselves good enough to play in the semi-pro Class D North Atlantic Baseball League. One such team was the Lansdale Dukes. In 1948, they took the field at Memorial Park and slugged it out with rivals from Carbondale, Stroudsburg, Nazareth, and teams from New York. By August, the Dukes were 18 and a half games out of second to the last place and finished the season with 28 wins and 101 losses. Needless to say, the manager quit, and Jake Shelley quit as president of the Lansdale Athletic Club, which had operated the team. Sadly, the Dukes were unable to find a major league sponsor, and the team folded at the end of the season. The league had lasted from 1946 to 1950. On a brighter note, the Nighthawks, named because they were able to play at a lighted ball field, were a more successful semi-pro baseball team. During the decade, they were often in the playoffs of the East Penn League, winning the 42 and 43 seasons. Jim Crawford and Ken Paust led the Lansdale High School football teams to many victories, 
winning the Bucksmont title in 1945 and 1948. Under the leadership of Coach Paus, the 44 team outscored their opponents 183-19, to but believe it or not, finished second in the league. The 1948 team ended the season with the traditional Thanksgiving Day game against the Doylestown Hornets. Coming from behind, the Lansdale Huskies defeated the Hornets 20-7 and finished with an undefeated season. The girls' hockey team won the Bucksmont Championship in three consecutive years with the coaching of Mary Bell Doc Waldo, the 1945-1947. On the technology scene, in 1948, one million households owned a TV. Jacques Cousteau invented the Aqualung, later known as Scuba. Bell Labs invented the transistor. Car phones and color TV were in the development stages. A popular invention was sunscreen, which led to the formation of the Coppertone Company. Duct tape was originally called duct tape by the troops because water easily ran off of it. Other popular inventions were instant coffee, the slinky, and Tupperware, which originally sold in department and hardware stores and soon went to the home party scene. While working for Raytheon, a military contractor, Percy Spencer discovered the cooking properties of microwave radiation when a candy bar melted in his pocket. Makes you wonder what was happening to Percy. The early microwaves were large and had very few features compared to today. The Polaroid camera sold for a very pricey $89.75. Ballpoint pens, box cake mix, the kidney dialysis machine, aerosol spray cans, the frisbee and silly putty were all invented in the 1940s. In the late 40s we were introduced to some early versions of what are now very popular products. Johnson & Johnson introduced the first mass marketed disposable diaper and Playtex introduced the draper in early 1950. And kitty litter, made from granulated clay, which had been used to absorb grease and oil in factories, became available. Velcro and the ever-popular Legos and Scrabble were new and exciting products. If you were living in Lansdale in the 1940s, you knew that Hojaka had opened a new showroom in the old Butler Buick building. Tom Mix, a popular cowboy movie star who had performed at the Hatfield Fair, died in an automobile accident. The Lands Florax, a flower shop at 17 West Main, and J. David Sprouse were popular flower shops. Due to the impending war, Trishon, makers of underclothing for the military, expanded its facility on North Broad. J. Jewelers opened at 30 West Main, and nearby was Schultz's jewelry store. A pre-war business boom was happening with Lansdale Clothing, Lansdale Paper Container Company, Theodore Keller Foundry, and Perfect Foods all needed to expand or move to larger locations. National Union Radio opened and would make TV tubes after the war. State regulations ended the yellow quarantine signs for mumps, chickenpox, measles, and whooping cough, but infantile paralysis became a problem and children were banned from public places, such as movie theaters, trains, and even churches. And the Lansdale School opening of 1941 was delayed. 
We enjoyed the deer and the numerous rabbits that were brought to Memorial Park, a gift from the Norristown Zoological Gardens, and we took our children to Lansdale's first Easter egg hunt. When the war ended, Burgess Elwood K. Bean declared that V-Day celebrations were in a proper and ordinary manner. But we did celebrate by sounding the air raid sirens after forewarning the community that it was not an actual raid. A dignified observance and community thanksgiving were the central themes of the plan. If the peace announcement reached Lansdale by 2 p.m., the celebration would be that day. But if the news arrived after that time, the following day would be a half holiday and the celebrations would begin. The Lansdale Merchants Association agreed to close all stores immediately and many offices and plants would close for the remainder of the day. In early May 1945, the official announcement came from President Truman that the Germans had accepted unconditional surrender. The announcement in Lansdale was made by the sounding of the Old Town Bell on the roof of the Veterans Home on Cortland Street. On VE Day at 7.30, all churches had special Thanksgiving services and later that evening, everyone gathered at Lansdale High School Auditorium for a community Thanksgiving service at which clergy from Trinity Lutheran Church, Lansdale Methodist Church, St. Stanislaus, Holy Trinity Episcopal, and Congregation Beth Israel Synagogue were participants. The Lansdale High School a cappella choir and the high school band performed. In early August 1945, there was a feeling that the Japanese might surrender soon. When word came from President Truman that the Japanese had surrendered, thousands of residents poured into the business district for an impromptu parade that lasted until midnight. The official victory parade on August the 15th began at Maine and Cannon and ended at Memorial Park with a band concert. The military and civic organizations that marched in the parade were the Veterans of Foreign Wars, the William E. Hare Post, the Volunteer Medical Service Corps, and the Fairmount Fire Company. The business district closed and churches were open for worship. Again, the borough solicited the opinions of the residents for an idea for a memorial for the veterans of World War II. A committee of Legion members and representatives from civic and patriotic organizations reviewed the su suggestions from a ballot that had been published in the reporter. A two-panel granite monument was erected in Memorial Park. During a coal shortage after World War II, places of entertainment were, would receive no coal unless they were connected to a house or a store, in which case the heat had to be reduced. Lansdale complied with the directive with no problem. The Burgess ordered a 100-day quarantine for dogs because of an outbreak of rabies in the borough. If your dog, even though licensed, was caught running at large, it would be killed. Joseph K. Curry of 163 Jenkins Avenue invented a booth for a bank that would trap a robber. A customer would enter the booth, an electric eye could detect a weapon, and when the teller opened his window, the door would lock behind you. Great for privacy, but the robber would be trapped in the booth. The door would unlock when the teller closed the window at the end of the transaction. National Union Radio was sold to Philco. Central Automatic Sprinkler Company bought part of the Abram Cox Foundry on North Cannon 
and roll casting manufacturers of aluminum and magnesium casting and aircraft parts opened at 3rd and Cannon. The borough purchased 275 parking meters and Burgess Elwood K. Bean was the first to deposit a nickel. The William E. Hare Post remodeled the building at 2nd and Walnut. A coal strike resorted in local brownouts and no outdoor lighting and store displays were permitted. Marcel Winninger bought the Hotel Tremont and became one of the most popular places to, to dine. He had been the chef at Wanamaker's Tea Room for 12 years and also owned the Union House in Percocet. He continued running the French restaurant until 1980 when his son Paul took over. Lansdale Junior High School on Main Street was destroyed by a fire in December 1946. The destroyed school building was sold at public auction to George F. Krauthammel, who had planned to make it into a community center. But it was not until June 1958, 12 years after the fire, that he was finally court ordered to remove the building. Burgess Bean welcomed Aunt Jemima to Ralph's service market and enjoyed the first pancake. Sharp and Dome took over the SKF building in Wales Junction. The State Highway Department rejected Borough Council's proposal for a traffic light at 7th and Broad, despite numerous accidents and the number of cars and pedestrian traffic did not meet the requirements of the state. Lansdale has always loved a contest, whether it is to name a parade or create a new slogan. Joseph Carrigan won the Lansdale Slogan Contest in August 1947 with Lansdale Grows as Electricity Flows. The PA Turnpike was extended to King of Prussia. Lansdale Tube expanded production of cathode ray tubes. Samuel Drissel bought the business block at Susquehanna and Cortland, which contained a shoe repair, barber, watch repair, and a yarn shop. Draft registration continued at York Avenue School with teachers as clerks. The World War II field pieces at Memorial Park were moved back to a less conspicuous spot. First National Bank used teller machines which gave checking account customers a receipt, eliminating the need for a passbook. The nearby popular amusement park, Willow Grove Park, was damaged by fire. Turbo Machine Company manufactured parts and assembled the Kenvo Vendor, which dispensed chocolate-covered ice cream on a stick. The Atherton, a boarding house and restaurant, was damaged by fire. An 80% increase in real estate assessment was levied to relieve the school district finance crisis and bring underassessed properties into line with others. The Borough Council reacted by cutting the tax rate to adjust for the upturn in the real estate assessment. Perfect Foods, maker of chipsels, sweetsels, and tritzels, opened a modern bakery on Creble Avenue. St. Stanislaus's new school was dedicated and a building loan was approved for the building of the Line Street School. And the American Chick Sexing Association was located on Mount Vernon Street. During the 1940s, the average cost of a new home was between $4,000 and $8,000. And our annual income was around 1800 and up to about 3000 by the close of the decade. Minimum wage was 30 cents an hour. 
At the grocery store, we paid 52 cents for a gallon of milk, 33 cents for a dozen eggs, and flounder cost 25 cents a pound. We could buy Campbell's tomato soup, three for 25, and a fresh chicken for 55 cents a pound. A letter could be mailed for three cents. A gallon of paint at United Paint and Wallpaper was two ninety eight, and we could stop at Mason's Beauty Salon on West Main and get the latest hairstyle. We paid between eleven and seventeen cents for a gallon of gas to put in our cars, which cost about eight hundred and fifty to just under fifteen hundred. We shopped at the local furniture stores for all of our decorating needs, prepared our meals with the latest appliances, and wore the most stylish fashions available in the Lansdale area. As you can see, Lansdale was a busy and changing borough during the 1940s, and so were things changing at home. As men went off to war, women took over the workplace which meant less time for household chores, meal preparation, but there was still a feeling of conservation in the post-war years. We shopped at Clemens Market, the A&P, Ralph's, the Lansdale Market at Green and Cortland, and the smaller mom and pop grocery stores. In 1943, Kraft sold 80 million boxes of mac and cheese. Now that is 364 million. Jello salads, Lord Woolton pie made from potatoes, which filled you up, plum charlotte, meatloaf, mashed potatoes, coleslaw, butter substitutes, apple brown betty, and casseroles were all popular and made use of homegrown veggies, leftovers, and day-old fruits or stale bread. We enjoyed a Coca-Cola, a Schmitz or Valley Forge beer, or a cup of eight o'clock coffee. We went to Drissel and Batham to purchase the latest styles in Venetian blinds and linoleum floors, or to Kaufman's furnishes, at Maine and Green for the latest in living room furniture. And of course, we wanted the most modern kitchen, so off to Lansdale Ice and Storage for a coolerator, or to Kaufman's for a gas range, and to Lansdale Sports and Electric for a cabinet sink to put in our homes. The estate of George S. Snyder and Krupp, Myers, and Hoffman were the places for building supplies. When it came to clothing, we shopped at Beinhackers, Hager's, the Town Shop, and the two storefronts in the Masonic Hall, Bartholomew's, and next door at Jean's. We also went to Levine's and Sam Fruit's Shoe Store. Or we bought fabric at Creeble's and made our own clothing. Some of us even ventured to blocks in Norristown for a fur coat. And how can we forget E.K. Bean Jeweler and Kohler's? We went to Yoakum Ford, Reikley Buick, J. Alfred Pontiac, and T.D. Kaiser to purchase a car so we could go to the Hotel Tremont, the Ruelle, or the Etherton for dinner or to a 60 cent movie at the Music Hall or the Lansdale Theater, or maybe a day at West Point Park, or bowling at the Lands Bowl, to a football game or a baseball game, or dancing at the Rec. Or we stayed home and listened to the radio or read the evening bulletin and giggled to our favorite comic strips, Archie, Brenda Starr Reporter, Pogo, and Hazel. In the early 40s, children were raised following the guidelines 
that they should be kept on a strict schedule of feeding and naps, never mind what the baby wanted. It was not until 1946 and the baby boomers that trends in parenting changed when Dr. Spock's The Common Book of Baby and Child Care was published. His theory was, don't be afraid to trust your own common sense. Parents were to show love and affection to their children rather than constant strict discipline. We went to Mrs. Oberhalter's kindergarten near 6th and Chestnut. We played with tiddlywinks, erector sets, Lincoln logs, electric trains, paper dolls, and the board games Clue and Candyland. We wore cloth diapers and had metal strollers with sharp edges. And we rode our tricycles without a helmet and somehow survived. One of the best known Lansdale residents was Elwood K. Bean, our Burgess from 1929 to 1959. E.K. Bean took his job as Burgess seriously, especially when it came to the police department. According to state law, the Burgess is the head of the police department. An ardent supporter of the police, he frequently knocked heads with borough council when they tried to interfere with the running of the department. He felt that newer council members wanted to take charge and run things to suit themselves. In 1942, he protested the appointment of police officers without an examination. The council used the excuse in an emergency during a time of war and then did nothing for six months. Morale in the police department became so low that Officer Kenneth W. Lear resigned, saying that he had offers of other positions. Chief Samuel Wolfenden commented that he had lost one of his best men. Besides numerous ribbon cuttings and proclamations, the Burgess was busy as a jeweler and registered optometrist. A graduate of the Eastern School of Optic in 1894, he was a member and president of the Lansdale Merchants Association and a member of the Businessmen's Association, which was an offshoot of the Board of Trade. He was once arrested for receiving stolen property, but was released with no charges. Teenage boys had stolen a sample class ring from Upper Gwynedd High School and a watch from a local neighbor and sold them to the unsuspecting jeweler. He was a 32nd degree Mason, a member of the Royal Arch Chapter Damascus Commandery, a 50 year member of the Shiloh Lodge, a member of the Independent Order of Odd Fellows, the Knights of the Golden Eagle, and St. John's United Church of Christ. He and his wife, Minerva Hendricks, lived at 328 Columbia Avenue and had one daughter, Frances, the wife of George L. Clayton. He had one granddaughter and two great-grandchildren. He died February 24, 1960, at the age of 91. The decade ended with the 75th anniversary celebration of Lansdale's Charter. The festivities began with a Community Day theme parade and continued with a day devoted to firemen, veterans, religious organizations, and finally, an air show. And again, I thank you very much for joining me for a look at Lansdale in the 1940s.